Thank you, Lydia. I took my coat off just to make sure that my coat wasn't messing with my mic. So that's why I, I did that, friends. Um, you know we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, guys, it's in Galatians chapter 5. Um, Galatians 5 essentially gives us an idea or the picture of the character of God. Sometimes we think of the fruit of the Spirit as a list of virtues or kind of a, like a self-help character development for dummies. And that's not the case. Not the case at all. The fruit of the Spirit is the product of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it's the sign of the person who's being led by that Spirit. And the ultimate one who was led by the Spirit is Jesus Christ. He, he is baptized in Matthew 3, and there's in other Gospels as well. But in Matthew 3, he's baptized. He comes up and receives the Spirit. And then Matthew 4 starts off by saying, immediately he is led out into the wilderness by the Spirit. And he exhibits the life from that point on of a man who is being led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, experiences union with the Spirit, and lives the life of a Spirit-led individual. In John 14, he gives us like this wonderful, this wonderful comfort. He says, I'm, I'm going to go away, but the Spirit's coming to you, and He will fill you, and He will teach you all the things about me. He makes that promise to his disciples. And then in um, Acts chapter 2, I think it's the Pente Pentecost, right? Where the um, Spirit comes down upon the disciples and it fills them. And as the message of Jesus goes out, it's a message that's empowered and fueled by the Spirit. And the lives of the people who experience the Spirit are changed dramatically into lives that reflect the very character of Jesus the character given to us in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the images of Jesus' character. And those are the that's the image of Jesus' character that he gives to you. It's a promise. It's happening. It's good news. You will experience it as you continue to walk and follow him. Walk in, in him and follow him and experience the work of the Spirit in your own life. And so it's, it's exciting for us to talk about the work of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit because it is yours. Now, it's not like a manifestation, put out positivity and grab it. That's just a fact. It's just true. The Spirit is working in you to produce this fruit. And today we're actually talking specifically about one of those fruit, uh, patience. Patience. I, I listened to this podcast by Tom Nelson. It's called The Flourishing Pastor because I'm always looking for help. Um, uh, in flourishing, and uh, he talks about Yoda, you know, Yoda, the uh, Star Wars character, as being the one who knows, because the Hebrew word for Yoda is yada, and so there's this little word play, Yoda is the one who knows, and he knows all there is to know about the Force, and in The Empire Strikes Back is where we meet Yoda. I, I, I feel like I'm, you guys know this, right? How, how many of you have seen The Empire Strikes Back? Please raise your hands. All right, all right. I feel like I saw it. most hands. I wasn't looking at everybody, but I, w w m the quick scan. I th I, Tommy's hand was like really slow. It's like, wait, have you not seen it? <laughs> Sorry, Tommy. Um, uh, anyway, uh, in The Empire Strikes Back, you get this picture of patience from the one who knows Yoda. You guys remember um, when Yoda first comes up on the scene, he's in this reptile-infested, slimy swampland where Luke is looking for the Jedi warrior who's going to train him and, and help him become a Jedi master himself. And this little green, obnoxious, kind of cute, but also weird-looking creature uh, shows up and is, is just a complete annoyance for the five, first five minutes. And Luke eventually says, hey, look, you know, we're looking for this guy, this Jedi warrior, a great warrior. And Yoda says, um, oh, you seek Yoda. And, he, and Luke is like, oh, you can help me. You know who this Yoda guy is. And, and uh, the little green dude says, yes, take you to him, I will. And he like hits him with his, his cane. But first we have to go eat. And um, Luke goes to this little cave thing. It's kind of, a, it's like a cool kind of comfy looking place, but it's too small for Luke. And uh, Yoda is just kind of constantly testing him and saying, hey, let's eat first, let's eat first, let's slow down and eat first. And, and Luke is like, man, we got to go, 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 I want to get there. Let's go find 
Yoda, he can make me a Jedi Master, and I can get off of this slimy green place. That's my hope. Um, and uh, Yoda uh, eventually gets so exasperated, and he has this conversation with the ghost of Obi-Wan after uh, Luke blows up. Luke says something to the effect of, I don't even know what I'm doing here. Let's just go. And Yoda gives this deep sigh. And I watched this video like four times so that I could write all of this down. Um, Yoda says to the ghost of Obi-Wan, I cannot teach him. The boy has no patience. And he goes on to say, uh, this one a long time have I watched, as in Luke Skywalker, who he watches through the Force, which is wild. Um, All his life, as he looked away to the future, to the horizon, never his mind on where he was, what he was doing. Adventure, excitement, a Jedi craves not these things. And then he looks at him with like this penetrating look. It's painful and like creepy. There are a couple of times when like Yoda's like just creepy. And this is one of them. You guys know what he says? To Zen? Like, he says, you are reckless. And I think that Yoda's expression of what patience is, is kind of the way that we think about patience. And I'm going to pose that God has a different perspective of patience. Um, and the patience that God lives in is a lot different than the patience that Yoda is calling for in uh, uh, the first, or the second Star Wars film that came out, Empire Strikes Back. Um, but Yo- what Yoda is seeming to imply is that patience is the opposite of recklessness, impulsivity. Um, it's the opposite of being quick to act without forethought. It's the opposite of impetuousness, I think that's a word, restless, hastiness, and those are all um, the opposite. Um, The ideas of patience, then, would be calm, composure, self-control, restraint. And in a sense, we see Luke exhibit that in the very next film. He shows up on the scene in this long black robe walking in the desert. And he walks into this like crazy job of the hut lair, and he's composed, he's calm, he's unshakable. He knows who he is. He's experienced the rest and calm of living in the moment, being okay with himself, and it keeps him from losing it or being reckless. And as you see Luke progress throughout the uh, Return of the Jedi, you see this patience has come to him. But, again, this is a patience that is separated from any type of goodness. And what I mean by that is it could be, you could be just as patient around really evil things as Luke is around his good mission. Does that make sense? You can be patient for wickedness or just for, you know, trying to be a better person as opposed to to the experience that God has in patience. And we're going to look at the patience we find in Galatians 5 through James 5. All right. You guys ready? We're getting into the meat of the sermon now. That was a very long introduction (laughs) of all that patience isn't. So let's talk about what patience is. Uh, James, James 5, verses 7 and following. Be patient then, brothers until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen that what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Let's pray and dive into what we have here. Father, I ask that you would work your patience, true patience, into us. Not just, not just composure or confidence, but the picture of what you have for us that we may taste and see your goodness and we may experience in a beautiful way your patience with us. 
and reflect it out. Be working, Lord. Be with the words of my mouth that I may speak what is pure and good. Be with the hearts of the, those listening that they would hear the Spirit and be changed and turn to you and experience you anew this morning. Father, would you work? You are the one that works. In your name I pray. Amen. So we see um, patience demanded here, but I want to give you a little bit of the context of James 5 and of the book of James in general. All right? The book of James can be summed up in this. James doesn't want you to conform to the, the powers of the world, but he wants you to be transformed by the Spirit and the Word that will make you pure. James is seeing two opposing worlds, and he is longing. He is longing for, one, for you to live into the life of the Spirit. That's the hope of James. And he's writing specifically to a community um, that, let me just see if I can, he's writing specifically to a community Let's see if that works better. Um, He's writing specifically to a community that has been dispersed from the place of Israel. James says, hey, this is for the, the the 12 tribes in dispersion. So Christian communities who have popped up around the world. And they are, generally speaking, poor, impoverished, and in trouble. At least incredibly vulnerable. And, Paul, and James is calling on them to live faithfully in light of suffering, to live faithfully as the impoverished community of God, knowing that their God is looking out for them. Now, not all of the community is impoverished. There are some that are wealthy amongst them, as James kind of a- a- indicates. But for the majority of this community, they are at the mercies of the powers that be. And James reveals that they're also being um, brutally um, abused. So they're being dragged to court. Um, They're being withheld their wages for the work that they're doing. They're being, um, James 5 says, uh, murdered and condemned. The, The powers that be, the courts of the system that they live in, are against them. And they're experiencing the pain and the agony of injustice on their lives. And there's the question, do I turn from following the Lord and take the tools that seem to be here for my own enrichment? Or do I continue to follow the Lord? And James is saying, follow the Lord in his ways. And so James 5 um, that begins with this brutal experience of how the wealthy, the powerful amongst them are abusing them. He says, um, this is not in the text that we read earlier, Uh, he says, look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent. And that term innocent is actually dikaianos, which is the righteous, who were not opposing you. The powers that be are destroying the impoverished community of the people of God. And James is saying to that community, brothers and sisters, be patient. So the term for patience is um, uh, macrothumia, which is a funky word, but we'll get into um, where we see it. It's the combination of a word for explosive anger and thumos and a word for lengthening in macro. So this this compound Greek term emphasizes slow to anger. Slow to anger. Kind of like what Lydia read earlier in Jonah. God is one who's slow to anger. And in fact, throughout the Old Testament, it's a term that is most regularly used of God. Um, The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, but at one point... Um, Greek scribes translated it. And wherever it says the Old Testament word says slow to anger, the Greeks translated that with this term, which is fascinating. 
And the place we see it first and foremost, or most strongly, is in、um, Exodus 34. And in Exodus 34, the people of Israel have come out of Egypt. They've, experi- they've, they've experienced、uh, slavery and have been set free. They're out in the wilderness. God gives them the Ten Commandments. And then Moses goes up onto the mountain to like, be like, hey, let's talk about how we're going to continue going about things. And while Moses is away, they're like, oh, God is. <sighs> Moses is gone. Who's going to lead us? Let's build a calf, which is breaking the very first commandment that they had just agreed to. So the people of Israel last about 10 hours. And then they are ready to worship an idol again, who they name as Yahweh.、Um, and God is like infuriated with them. He is furious. And he says to Moses, Dude, <laughs> he doesn't say that. <laughs> he says, Moses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe out these people and I'm going to make a nation of you instead. And Moses is like, No, please don't do that, Lord. Please don't do that. For your own, the sake of your own character, don't do that. And God listens to him, which is just nuts. He, like, our God, supreme, all powerful, he wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from you. He wants you to talk to him and tell him, hey, Lord, this doesn't seem to be in, in line with your character. You're not, you're not naming something that's, that's true of him. He's not actually living out of、uh, lack of his own goodness. But he is inviting you into conversation. And Moses lives that up. And says, please don't. And the Lord says, I will not. I will not do this. And Moses is so blown away by the kindness of God、um, that he's overcome. And he t- goes back up into the mountains and he says, Lord, please let me see your beauty. Please let me see your holiness. And God says, You can't. It would destroy you. But I'm going to put you in this cleft of this rock, which is like, think of like this, right, that I'm standing in. <laughs> I'm going to. Do something weird, right? I'm going to put you in here and you're going to see my glory as I pass by, right? Like that's, that's the idea. And God passes by and he proclaims his name. It was really weird being down there and talking to you all, by the way. <laughs> he proclaims his name and he says, He says, I'm the Lord, the Lord, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. It's in、um, Exodus 34, I think it's verses 6 and 7. Look it up if you have time at some point today and reflect on it. Guys, it's worth, it's worth highlighting, memorizing, because you're going to find here. In fact, I'll just turn there to, with you now and read it. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the father to the third and fourth generation. It's a statement of God's pure holiness, goodness, and kindness, and his unwillingness to,、um, to hold with justice. It's the both and. And with, within this expression of who God is, It's repeated again and again and again and again in old, the Old Testament. I looked at like, the ESV's、um, study Bible、uh, references, of, cross references of how many times? 26 times. And that didn't include what Lydia read. The, like, this announcement of who God is, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, is replete. And the idea of being slow to anger. Means that he is slow to explode at people's sin. He's going to wait a long time and take on people's sin. Think about making something beautiful.、Uh, maybe if, a Lego world. Maybe it's a compu- like a computer animated world. A, an art, a picture or a, a book that you've written. And someone looking at it and just like, abu- like ugh, ugh, yuck. Tearing it up, misplaying with it, misusing it, hurting the things that you love in it. That's what God faces every day with the way that we treat one another and the way that we treat this world. He sees it and it hurts him. And I know it hurts him because in Genesis chapter 6, The atrocities of humanity have become so much that God says, I am sorry that I even made man. And it says, I am grieved to my heart. Can, is that like, incredible to you? 
God is not some distant light force that doesn't really care. He knows and experiences the hurt that we put on one another. When I'm cruel to you, when you're cruel to one another, when, when we are cruel to those around us, God feels all of that. And he bears it. He bears it. In Isaiah 43, he says, look, um, he says, you, you have burdened me with your sin. Don't think of God as being distant. The idea of patience, the idea of macrothemia, is that God bears with our wickedness. I want you to think of times that you have done that. And this is why it's so different than what Yoda says. Because with Yoda, when Luke Skywalker, he's like, dude, look ahead or stay in the moment, right? Have a sense of calm about you, regardless of the circumstances. With patience, God is saying, I'm going to let you beat me again and again and again, and I'm going to wait. And in Romans 2, it gives us why. That you might repent. That you might turn from your sin and see the kindness of God and look to me. That's, that's nuts. The God of all power is going to allow us to hurt him so that he can save you and work in you and make you new. And God has done this, I mean, with Adam and Eve. He could have wiped them out right there. He could have said, that's it. We're done. You two are, are, are evil, and I'm starting over. And that would have wiped out every one of us because we're all in the genetic pool. But he said, no, I'm going to wait. No, I'm going to work redemption in your lives. And I'm going to work redemption through the life of Noah. And I'm going to work redemption through the offspring that keep going. And so he bears with our sin so that we might turn to him. Why hasn't Jesus already come back? <laughs> so that we have a chance. So that Asher and Ezra, my kids, your kids, the kids that you will have, have a chance. I don't know how long God is going to withhold, but he is waiting, bearing the pain of this world, so that all might know him and come to see him. That's patience. That's the kind of macrothemia that Galatians is talking about. And Jesus exhibits it almost better than anybody else. Jesus, um, Matthew 18, he, he has this story about these two servants. Peter comes to him and is like, hey, uh, dude, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brothers? And Jesus says to him, there is no limit, essentially. You must forgive your brothers continually because you have been greatly forgiven. And he gives this whole story about people crying out for the patience of God with their own debts and then not being patient with others. Jesus exhibits this in, with his disciples. At one point he cries out, oh, you faithless generation, how long am I to bear with you and your, your lack of faith? He, he uh, weeps at the gates of Jerusalem. Israel, Israel, or Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long have I wanted to bring you in? But you won't. You won't have it. And he goes to the cross in silence and is slain on the cross, revealing the patience of God and forgiving even those who cry, cru cru who cry out crucify. This is patience. This is what we're talking about. James 5. Be patient then, brothers. Be patient. Remember, James 1 through 6 emphasizes what is happening to these people. They are being abused by the oppressive authorities at play. And I use that term, um, abuse, intentionally because it's what's going on. The powers that be are twisting the courts to work to the ill of the people of God, of the righteous, of the innocent. The powers that be are using them for work but not paying them. 
are using, the, are using the, 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 um, those who have no means to defend themselves. It is cruelty and it is wickedness and it is abuse. It is the controlling or the limiting of another's agency and freedom. And guys, God hates it. He hates it. It's so important for you to hear me say this. This is, this is how the abusers, and the, oppressed get, um, uh, the abusers and the oppressors get named in James 5. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Brothers and sisters, I don't like to do this because I don't like calling out sin. It's really scary for me. But if, if there are abusers here, this is the word of God to you. Beware. It must stop. Now is the moment of God's patience with you. And it's for your repentance. Turn to him. Tear it out. Get rid of it. Notice, um, uh, that, notice that James doesn't say brothers when he says, now listen, you rich people. But in verse 7, he says, be patient then, brothers. This is the family. These are the people who God is seeing. Verse 4 emphasizes, look, the wages you have failed to pay to the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. The Lord is listening for the voices of the oppressed, and he is just. Don't let his patience fool you. Justice comes because he is just. He will bear with it a long time. Oh, friends, And he calls us as his people to bear with it as well. And let me clarify, because that's a very, very, very challenging and painful thing to hear me say. All right? Bearing with an abusive reality is not quietly taking it. It's not bowing your head down and singing, look down, look down, I'll always be a slave. This is just what patience looks like. It doesn't look like taking the beating. What it does look like in this text is not using the same tools of violence and oppression against another. You can swap it. You can fight back with fire. You can revolt. You can rebel. And the Lord is saying, that's not patience. Use the, ju the justice systems that are available to you. Come to the church and talk to your pastors and your elders. God, help them, help us that we would do right by you. There are avenues for you to pursue, and you should pursue them, and you should try and stay, stay safe. Protect yourself from abuse. James is not saying don't, but he is saying we don't use the tools of abuse to change the outcome or to swap the battle. Does that make sense? He's saying, he's calling us to live in patience, to live in patience and cry out to the Lord. There's a quote here that I want to read from Miriam um, and... Oh, forgive me from Miriam and uh, Craig Blomberg, Miriam Kamel and Craig Blomberg. The Greek term calls the believers to wait because they recognize the Lord's Sabaoth coming, justice. Meanwhile, they can prophetically denounce injustice as the prophets do in verses 10, and they promote fair treatment of poor laborers. The oppressed should not take justice into their own hands with violence but should wait for the appearing of the Lord. We don't fight the world's battles the way the world fights them. We fight with the Lord. 
and we call to the Lord. And you may need to remove your, how, your presence from the person who's abusing you. You may need to seek escape. Goodness gracious, Paul says to the slaves, um, if you can gain your freedom, do it. But he calls us to wait and not take an explosive nature in response. Now, that explosive nature is different than the nature of James's woe to you oppressor. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I don't know why I keep asking you guys that question because it's not like you guys are going <laughs> to, you could nod or say, yeah, we're good, but you don't have to. Um, when Jesus cries out against oppression and abuse, that is the picture that we take on. It's not a lack of patience that's naming what is wrong, and it is good to name what is wrong in this world, and it is good to weep and to wail. The prophets are one example. They are constantly calling the people of God back to faithfulness and naming the abuse that is happening. They're one example. The other example is Job, who wails for the Lord. He wails for the Lord to come and, and rescue him. And it's the longest, um, the longest book that is specifically for the wisdom literature. And he is constantly saying, Lord, why? 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 That's, that's the walk of patience. And Job is completely absolved from any wrongdoing at the end of the book of Job. God says, in all this, Job never sinned. In all of his wails, and all of his, I wish I were just dead, and all of the pain that he experiences for his loss. Um, I'm going to share with you a really heavy story of my family. Um, there, there was a time when something really awful happened in my family. Like, really, really awful. And I'm not going to exactly name it, um, as it's not necessarily my story to share. But... Um, we went to the police for justice. And the police heard our case. And they said, you guys don't have the evidence. This is not a case we can try. I'm sorry for your pain. Have a nice day. And my family was, my family was distraught. And my brother ran back in to the, off, to the police station and he yelled, if you guys don't do what's right, then I will. I'll take justice into my own hands. Please do what is right. And they said, don't do that. Have a nice day. They, they, they couldn't do anything. And my brother went out onto the, um, onto the, uh, the parking lot rail. You know how there's those little like cement lips? And he just sat down and cried. Because there was nothing that could be done. Justice was denied. And now we have to sit patiently in the pain of this anguish. And he didn't take justice into his own hands, to his credit. But he took the, took the life of Job and wailed and wept. And we moved forward trying to figure out what life would look like now that there will be no resolution in this world to what has happened. That is the life of patience, and it is brutal. Where does this patience come from? It comes from a hope, friends. It comes from the hope of what God is doing, the hope that God will come back and set us free, the hope that there is Jesus coming. James 5 emphasizes it again and again. In verse 7, he says, uh, be patient until the coming of our Lord. In verse 8, be patient for the Lord is, his coming is near. And then in 9, again, the judge is coming. This is coming to an end. And it's coming to an end with the glory of God coming down and saying, enough! My people are vindicated. It is over. And all that is wrong will be made right. Patience flows from hope. The hope of our Lord's return. We don't wait for nothing. We aren't patient because we just got to be patient. We're patient in hopeful trust of the one who says, I will come back and I will finish what I've started 
and all that is wrong, the injustice that my family experiences, the injustice that you experience, the injustice that we experience broadly, will be set right. Until that time, be patient. This is impossible. How do we do it? The only way to do it, friends, the, the only way to build patience in your life or have patience is not by trying, to har- trying better and, or working harder to have it. It's by looking at Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't look at you like Yoda and says, you're reckless. I can't teach him. He says, come all who are weary and heavy laden and bear my yoke. It's easy and it's light and I will pull side by side with you. When Jesus invites us to share his yoke, he's the primary bull and you're the second. And you look right into his eyes and he's pulling right with you. He's experienced death, he's experienced abuse, he's experienced oppression, he's experienced the rejection of his very father. And he comes to you and says, I will pull with you, I will disciple you, you will learn patience with me and from me and with me, I will train you. And he died for that very reason, that you would have this, that you would have this patience and grow in life. Friends, as we look to the table, as we look to the feast that God has prepared, I want you to remember there's another feast coming in which all that is wrong and broken and sinful will be wiped away and only the good will be left. And there will be no longer any need for patience because there will be no suffering and no wickedness in your heart or in the hearts of your brothers or neighbors. It will all be washed away and we will dance and rejoice in the joy of what our Lord has won for us and will win for us. That's the hope that fuels patience. Let me pray for us.